So the case is about a Miss VL, who's a 36 year old female laboratory technician. And I was approached by HR of a particular company about multiple absences from work with complaints of asthma symptoms and a verbal altercation with colleagues over their work practices, which had apparently exacerbated her symptoms. So the clinical details are not particularly interesting. So I will just briefly summarize them. I met with the worker, took a history, examined her, did pre and post bronchodilator spirometries, gathered collateral history, performed a site visit. And in general, she's got mild asthma controlled with salbutamol, has an asthma action plan, and she's well educated about her condition. Her symptoms are usually triggered by pollen and smoke. And when we saw her, she had normal spirometries. At her job, she had left work on one episode when she had felt chest tightness when someone operated an industrial lab furnace prior to her starting work. And one of the other occasions was when there was a large warehouse fire in a nearby suburb. So some of you who are from the surrounding western suburbs might remember this fire and very importantly she describes that her symptoms have not happened every single time the furnace is used it's there's only been a few occasions so that's a picture of the fire in question and on that particular day the majority of the western suburbs did contain some level of smog some worse than others so the industrial furnace in question is something used to clean experiment glassware. And the way they described it was that the glassware can, can contain anything from solvents to monomers to hydrocarbons to detergents. And as, as per the lab staff, they described that it was probably not practical for them to try and provide me with a list of everything that the glassware could possibly contain. So even if they tried, they couldn't really guarantee that they wouldn't then subsequently put something else in the glassware that they hadn't talked to me about. And the other thing was that the constituents of the products of combustion were not known. So even if they could tell me some of the things they were putting in the glassware, they couldn't tell me what was coming out of the exhaust stack after the furnace was used. The furnace is one of a set of two and they sit on a bench top. So when I use the word industrial furnace, people are probably picturing like a room sized piece of equipment, but it's more like a large microwave oven. And they, they were both ventilated by a little um, local exhaust ventilation that comes right down over the, the little exhaust stack. And the LEV ducting is connected to a ventilation system um, for the adjacent fume cabinet and air is drawn by the same fan. So this is a picture of the setup. That's the fume cabinet over there. So this was purchased by, uh, purchased from a manufacturer, you know, installed by professionals. Uh, it's got service tags. It, you know, is compliant with regulations and so on and so forth. And these are the two little industrial furnaces. And this one is the one that the patients complained about. Now, can anyone, tell me what jumps out at them when they first look at this and look at the LEV that's been set up. So that's the, this is the LEV system that they've put there. Anyone got any comments about what they're seeing here? No, not really, okay. Um, so when it was first described to me, I thought there's probably gonna be some problems if they tried to mock up an LEV and attach it to an adjacent fume cabinet fan. And when I saw this in person, I thought right away, there's definitely going to be problems there. So I'll list some of the things that I thought about. So first of all, the entire system is jury rigged and I confirmed with the people on site that it was fabricated by the maintenance workers from PVC pipe. So no one knew who had designed it. They were only sure that the designer was not someone with any sort of formal qualification in ventilation systems or safety engineering or fluid dynamics or any of that stuff. 
the system piggybacks from the fume cupboard, which I imagine would potentially compromise it. And the LEV ducting is much higher resistance than the fume cupboard. So air would preferentially move through the fume cupboard instead of the LEV when the fume cabinet sash is up. So the sash is this thing here, this piece of glass. And when you lower it, that decreases the amount of air that can go in at once, that the, the opening. And when you raise it, of course, you get a bigger opening for air to enter through. And they can't actually lower it all the way because if they do, it creates so much turbulence in here that it knocks the little experimental equipment pieces around. So normal operating height for the sash is actually where you see it sitting right now in this picture. So you compare how much air can go in through this massive opening as compared to this tiny little opening over here and this tiny little opening over here. So you can probably picture by now, if you turn the fan on, not much air is gonna go in through here and here because it's all going to wanna go in through here. There's there being not much resistance here. So continue, the LV ducting is also long and tortuous and narrow with multiple elbow joints that increase turbulence. And disclaimer, I don't know the appropriate physics terminology for all of the stuff that I've just described to you. I tried asking some engineer friends and they didn't know either. So moving on, how to assess the risk from industrial hygiene perspective. Does anyone want to yell out some suggestions? It'd be a lot more fun if you guys volunteered some opinions, no? So my thought on all this was the main existing limitation is that we don't really know what's coming out of the exhaust stacks. We don't know what the products of combustion are. Okay, so we'll, we'll move on. Um, so hopefully you guys engage a little bit more. So here's some pictures of industrial hygiene equipment that you might consider. And the questions are what are these and would they help? So does anyone know what this is on the left? Uh, it's a pitot tube. So it's for checking air velocity and it is potentially handy in this situation because you can put it into the ducting, but that involves drilling holes in the local exhaust ventilation, which people don't always like to do. So there are other options available, but this is a good one for like really serious, really important cases. This one, I'm sure almost everyone knows what that is. No one? People who sat their exams definitely know they're just keeping quiet and out of spite. Go on. Huh? <laughs> James? You definitely know what. Oh, all right. It's, it's a portable wet bulb globe thermometer. So it doesn't have like the three components and the office cube, but it sort of simulates some of the readings. But yeah, it's portable. Um, this thing on the left. This one's a bit tricky, so I might just tell you it's a UV photometer. And this one? Anemometer? Yes, it is a hot wire anemometer. Mm -hmm. So potentially useful, right? Because you can insert it into the LEV to check what the airflow is doing in this case, check whether it's actually suctioning anything out of the furnace. This one on the left. Plastic bag. Sorry, what's that? Plastic bag. That's exactly what it is. It's, <laughs> it's a sampling bag. Um, and do you think it's useful in this situation? Hang on. So I've had a chat with the industrial hygienists uh, on the case, and. It is potentially useful because it's particularly useful when you don't know what the constituents are of what you're collecting. Because then you can just collect a bunch of it and send it to a lab and ask the lab to tell you what's in it. So in this case, potentially useful. Um, but we didn't do it.
for this particular case, and I'll talk a little bit more about why later. And this thing on the right. Looks like a dust track partic particle monitor. That's absolutely what it is. It is an aerosol monitor. So potentially useful, yes, because you can check the air quality based on particulate matter 2.5 and 10 microns. And this one on the left. The picture is not very big, but you can sort of try and focus your attention on the tip of this little rod here. That's right, it's a vein anemometer. So you can see the little vein in there and potentially useful again, because you can check the airflow of the local exhaust ventilation. Uh, this thing on the right. I, I don't know what a mini ray is, but that's probably the brand of a photo ionization detector, I'm guessing, which is what this is. Uh, so it is an active air sampling device. You can use it to detect concentrations in the air of um, sort of whatever you set it to. So you can attach different types of probes and set it to detect different types of gases and such. So potentially useful. Uh, this thing on the left. Yeah, that's right. So it's a spore trap, probably not relevant. It's not interested in counting spores. And the device on the right. It's got a little probe, it's got this scale with a needle that can jump to the right and come back to the left. The Geiger Mueller counter, yep, exactly right. So probably not particularly relevant in this case, unless they tell you that they are going to incinerate something that's potentially radioactive. Um, that one, I'm sure everyone knows. It's a cyclone, it's for respirable dust. And I think this is the last one. Anyone? Uh, very close. So they are solvent tubes rather than the Jager tubes. Um, but yes, again, I would say these are both potentially useful because you might be interested in checking the respirable dust count. You might be interested in particular non-polar gases and you want to measure the concentrations and such. Oh, yeah, a little bit more, okay. That one's a white sampling template. So you can use it to check uh, levels of dust that have been in the air. And that one is a sound level meter, which probably isn't particularly relevant for this case. So the outcomes of the case. So I went and had a site visit, as I described, and the fume cupboard was ANZ compliant, it was regularly serviced, uh, they checked the face velocities, everything was fine. The LEV was not really compliant with anything, it had never been serviced ever since it was created. No one could tell me when it was created, but probably a few decades ago. It had zero meters per second airflow when the fume cupboard sash is at normal operating height. and it probably had zero meters per second airflow all along ever since its creation. So it's been there for a few decades, not actually suctioning anything. Did it actually connect to the duct of the fume cupboard above the clouds and it, the ceiling? It did. So the way we confirmed that was when we lowered the fume cabinet sash all the way down to a point where it couldn't actually be used and it was never operated under those conditions, that blocked off the airflow traveling from through the fume cabinet. So all the air instead had to go through the little local exhaust ventilation um, hoods. And at that point, we measured that it had 0 0.5 meters per second airflow, which potentially can be adequate depending on what's coming out of the exhaust stacks. So yes, it was actually connected, just that it had never actually done anything because they never used it under those, those circumstances. So the industrial hygienists on the site had assessed the 
problem initially as one of air quality because there's so many different ways that you can approach this problem. Do you try and look at the gases? Do you try and find out the, the constituents of the products of combustion? Uh, which again would involve you doing like a back collection and sending it to the lab for GCMS speciation. You probably get a list of like a hundred different chemicals and then you go and look up reference ranges for each of those hundred different chemicals and then it's, it is a gargantuan task looking at it from that perspective. So he chose a simple initial approach of just going by air quality. So looking at PM 2.5 and PM 10. And the aerosol monitoring for PM 2.5 and 10 from right on top of the furnace and from a bench top across the room review readings that were well below one day and one year limitations for any PM and WHO. That's National Environmental Protection Management. So I wrote up a brief report and made some recommendations to the HR person. And one of the top was perhaps you should consider further assessment for gaseous products and speciation of contaminants. And also to consider using the hierarchy of controls. So right up top is eliminate, which would involve outsourcing the cleaning of the glassware. Substitute, I couldn't really think of anything unless there's some sort of furnace that doesn't have an exhaust stack. So it just keeps the products of combustion inside the furnace itself. I tried to find some information on whether such a thing existed, but I couldn't really find anything. Isolation, so you could potentially do the furnace cleaning outdoors away from the lab environment. Engineering, so you could consider professionally designing an LEV system with a separate ducting and fan so that it would actually suction what was coming out of the exhaust tax. Administrative, so you could limit furnace use to after hours when no workers would be in the lab. So people finish up for the day, they put their glassware in, they turn the furnace on, everyone goes home and they come back overnight when, you know, if there's been dust coming out, it's already settled, hopefully. And PPE, we, we know lab workers aren't going to agree to that. It'd be uncomfortable, inconvenient, and it is, it is lowest in hierarchy anyway. So what did the company actually do? They jumped straight down to administrative and they said, well, we'll only use the furnace after hours when no workers will be in the lab. And they came up with sort of their own engineering solution. They promised me that one day they would possibly consider getting someone in to design a whole new system, a whole new fan and so on and so forth. But in the meantime, what they actually have done is stick some wadding into the local exhaust ventilation hood. And that way, even though it's not suctioning anything, when the smoke comes out, it will just fall onto the wadding and, you know, problem solved for now. <laughs> that was it. Thank you very much. Any questions? I think, the, the, I, think you, I think you said the lady's uh, symptoms didn't always correlate with her using this oven. Yes. So do we know the oven had any symptoms? Um, she was fairly specific about what triggered her symptoms and what didn't, and she particularly identified smoke and pollen. So she did say that sometimes when people burn their toast, I, I feel a little bit tight in the chest. And the thing about the furnaces were was because it was different every day what they were putting in the, into the furnace. Sometimes it produced more smoke and sometimes it didn't. Um, so I think that her being as educated and, and sort of cluey as she was, she was probably correctly identifying that that particular incident it had is just that most of the time there isn't that much smoke and it doesn't actually set off her symptoms. And I think she had a prior verbal agreement with most of the colleagues about not using the furnace when she was about to come into the shift. So because of that, she mostly had worked around the problem. How long ago did this occur and has she had any further episodes of asthma? This was in August of, was it August or October? Um, sorry, either August or, or October of last year. And no, she hasn't had any further episodes. 
also keeping in mind they have wadded up the local exhaust ventilation system, can't fall out of it anymore. Could the furnaces be moved into the fume cupboard as required? They look like microwave ovens. Is yeah. Someone suggested you could another administrative strategy. Yes, um, I think the problem with that is they need that experimental space to put out like lots of little burners and beakers and things like that inside the fume cupboard. So it is fairly full and they also operate the fume cabinet and furnaces independently running different experiments and, and cleaning at different times. So if they had to put the furnace in the fume cabinet and occupy for that, then they wouldn't be able to run experiments in the fume cabinet. Can I ask what the PM 2.5 and 10 concentrations were? Um, you certainly can. I will actually have to pull up the industrial hygiene report. So just give me a moment. So that's a table there. And down here are the one day and one year health standards set by NEPM and WHO. Um, and that's the readings collected on these dates. So really well below. I won't read them all out to you, but you can see for yourself. Yes, they're very low. Yep, yeah, thanks. Questions? Robert, would you like to take the floor? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so as um, Bert said, my my name is Mina. I'm a State B trainee. So today I'll be discussing uh, some of the exposure control measures for chromium that I observed during one of my um, worksite visits to a chromium electroplating plant. So I'll just give you some context. Um, this worksite visit occurred as part of a health surveillance uh, medical. Okay, so Company X was a, a small business um, located in the southeast suburb, very small, so only, only eight employees, including five electroplaters. These are all male, range, they had an age range of 31 to 65 years, and they've all been employed as electroplaters from between eight months to over 20 years. Now, interestingly, none of them had ever undergone any health surveillance for hexavalent chromium. Now, this particular company had um, three different types of processes for electroplating. There was rack, barrel, and uh, mechanical. So I only observed the first two um, because those, those were the only ones that were in operation when I attended the, um, the worksite visit. So just to recap some of the uh, properties and toxicology of chromium, in, in particular uh, chromium uh, six. So there are several chemical formulations for chromium. It can exist as a pure metal or as a compound. So there's chromium two, chromium three, which is called uh, trivalent. I think there's also chromium-4 and uh, chromium-6, the hexavalent chromium, which is the one of most interest given its uh, toxicity. Chromium also exists in uh, different forms, so as a dust. So for example, uh, chromates in cement. Um, it can also exist in fumes, so notably when you're welding stainless steel and also as a mist. Now, um, given the different forms that you can um, get of chromium, Exposure is potentially via all three main routes as well, so inhalation, dermal, and uh, ingestion. Now, uh, following exposure, the health effects can be immediate or chronic. So after acute uh, exposure, you know, the main complaints tend to be um, irritation of you know, the eyes, respiratory tract, the skin. Um, following long-term uh, exposure, workers can develop uh, chrome holes, which is skin ulcers, and also allergic dermatitis. 
it, it can also affect the respiratory tract as well. So leading to nasal septal ulcers and perforation. Um, they can also develop asthma and also lung cancer. So chromium-6 is categorized as a class one carcinogen by IARC. <clears throat> And now just before I show you some of the, the pictures of the processes, I think it's worth just um, discussing some of the principles of electroplating. So essentially items to be plated first undergo like a pre-treatment process. Um, so where they're kind of cleaned um, to remove any impurities or contaminants using uh, solvent degreasers, alkali and acid. And then the items to be plated are then placed in a solution of the metallic salt. So in this case, it would be chromium acid or um, a different kind of, uh, solution and then a current is passed through the solution and then what happens is that the the positive chromium ions uh, migrate to the item to be because it's it's uh, it has a, a negative charge okay so this is, the, this is the first process rack electroplating so I'll just show you the rack first of all so, so there is a rack um, there is a rack there and so it starts off at this point point here. And so the workers um, assemble the items onto the rack. And then it's actually a lifting aid that um, puts the rack into this series of baths in, in a particular sequence. And the last bath is the chromium, uh, contains a chromium solution. So in this case, it was chromium-3. So I'll just show you the, and then after it's been removed from the chromium-3 solution, it's placed on this hook here. The worker there is actually blow drying it just to remove any excess solution. And then it's placed in that oven there. So you can see him, he's wearing his, uh, his uh, chemical gloves. He's got short sleeve shirts. There's no face shield or, or anything on the face. And this is his overalls there. And then just, I observed, so this here is a roller door. I assume it was providing general uh, ventilation. And then this is just con uh, this protrusion here from the, from the ceiling, which they told me was the exhaust. So I just thought that was very um, interesting. So, so they are the baths that are uh, using the rack electroplating. And I think the one furthest down there is the chromium-3 solution containing bath. Okay, so process two, uh, barrel electroplating, essentially the same as rack electroplating. The, the main difference being that they prefer to put the bulkier items through the barrel electroplating. So there, so there is the barrel there. You can see it's suspended, you know, with this lifting aid here. And there is a worker. Um, he's, I think he's putting some of the items into the oven. So um, similar process, the lifting uh, device will deposit the barrel into this series of baths here. And in this particular setup, they use the hexavalent chromium um, as the final solution. Okay, so there is the chromium, uh, hexavalent chromium um, solution. Oops, yep. And it is, there's just the lid there. It was interesting that the um, label said, you know, keep lid on to avoid spoilage from the sun. So <laughs> this is a very uh, interesting observation. And then something else that was quite alarming was this is what the worker was wearing. He was the newest employee there. And he was just saying that he, you know, he found the, the chemical gloves just didn't give him that kind of manual, um, um, uh, you know, he's, he just, couldn't sort of fuel things properly, basically. Okay, so just using um, a hierarchy of controls, I, I did, you know, um, observe some good uh, practices there. So there was a substitution. So they use chromium-3 um, instead of 6 for one of the processes. So I guess by doing that, it reduces the, um, the opportunity for exposure to, to chromium-6. There were a few engineering controls, so partial enclosure of parts of the process. So where they were drying the items in an oven, there was actually already the lid on the chromium-6 bath. So this um, reduces kind of airborne um, uh, concentration of chromium. 
all the controls, uh, separating of the, the, the worker from the process. So using the lifting aids, you know, so the workers don't have to dip their hands into the solution. And so it reduces um, uh, dermal exposure. We already mentioned uh, general ventilation, and I guess in theory, it, it could help to dilute the, the airborne concentration of chromium. Um, but I guess this depend on you know, things like the layout of the plant floor, the position of the workers, the airflow, et cetera. And then as I already pointed out, some items of PPE, so the overalls, the gloves, and the safety boots. So however, there were some um, shortcomings that I mentioned. So that LED, so I didn't actually ask too many questions about it because I mean, uh, my main point purpose of being there was just to conduct the health surveillance. And I was lucky that they allowed me just to have a quick um, um, look around the floor. So, th so this they told me was the exhaust. Um, I'm really not sure if, you know, if this was supposed to be capturing any of the airborne sort of contaminants. And obviously it's so far away that it's probably not uh, gonna be very effective. I also query the adequacy of the PPE. So yes, you know, they've got their safety boots um, and you know, the gloves, but they tend to wear short sleeve shirts. So keep, keeping their arms exposed. The overalls also were non water, hang on. They were non waterproof. So, you know, the skin exposure and having non waterproof um, overalls, you know, is a chance of, you know, the splashes, you know, um, dermal uh, exposure. Also, he is blow drying the recently um, plated um, items so it can increase the airborne um, um, uh, levels of chromium. Yes, chromium three, I guess is not um, as much concern as chromium six, but chromium three um, is apparently um, allergenic and also they actually set exposure standards for chromium three. So it's possible that, you know, by blow drying and creating aerosols that you're exceeding the, the um, exposure uh, standards. Um, what else? And then just lastly, you know, there was no health surveillance there. There was no monitoring. So no environmental monitoring, uh, monitoring had been performed or any personal monitoring and even the admin controls. So I spent most of my time there just um, educating uh, the workers about the health effects of chromium. And they've, they've even informed me that, um, you know, they, they've taken their items of clothing home to, you know, to, uh, to, to be washed. So, so, you know, so there were quite a few uh, shortcomings uh, in terms of um, exposure control measures in that work site. And then just lastly, just to finish, there are some other, other activities that have the potential for high exposure. I, I didn't actually observe this when I was there, but you know, um, from my reading, you know, whilst replacing the baths or cleaning the baths, um, you know, it can um, result in high uh, levels of um, chromium. In fact, the workers told me that they tend to avoid, well, they preferred not to clean the acid baths because you know, they, they always became very, um, <laughs> overcome by the oh, by, by all the uh, the uh, fumes as they were cleaning. Also polishing the items can generate um, chromium dust as well. And then somebody who I didn't have a chance to see was the person who was doing all the, the maintenance. So um, clean, cleaning the equipment, um, servicing the equipment, et cetera, can also, um, you know, that worker is, is, you know, is likely to have um, high exposure to, to chromium. That's it. So how did this chromium actually come? Is it a bag or in bags? Or I didn't. So that was something that I, I, I didn't have a chance to, um, I didn't have a chance to talk too much there. So like I said, my main purpose there was to do the health surveillance. Actually, they, they weren't happy with me to even, even I only spent five or 10 minutes just doing a walk through and, um, so I, I didn't have enough chance to kind of go through everything from start to finish. And so that's why I said that one of the um, activities that would be nice to <coughs> learn more about would be kind of when they were um, doing the re replenishing. The reason I ask that is that is for your maximum concentration. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow, uh, as soon as it's made the solution, which would be the most concentrated form and with potentially the most harmful exposure. 
Yeah, I agree. The, yeah, that's right. This is a, the Chrome 3. Yeah, 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 it's a blow dryer, yes. Well, Nina, as I ask you, what, what specific health surveillance would you be recommending? Oh, so I was actually there to do the initial health surveillance for the company. So what happened was that WorkSafe apparently paid them a visit and then asked them to organize health surveillance. So and that's yeah, yeah, that's that's how that's how it's all. Well, so it was. Yeah, what, what did you recommend? So I recommended um, um, instigating a health surveillance and then just continuing with the health surveillance. So the initial, so we we set up a. So this was, this was done with David Elder as well. He was my supervisor at the time. So <laughs> David, if you want to have anything else to add to this, um, so we initially set up a. a information pack we sent to them it was a consent form and just information about why we're conducting the health surveillance and also just the questionnaire initially so just focusing on respiratory symptoms skin symptoms etc and then when i was there we did the spirometry um did the skin examination and then um i discussed just to do some of the health effects um of, of chromium so, you know, my main recommend, recommendation was that they should, you know, as per the standards, they should have regular um, health surveillance. So it's initially you have a pre, uh, kind of a, a pre-employment um, uh, assessment, and then you're meant to have, do the respiratory questionnaire after six weeks, after six months, and then annually. There's also meant to be a responsible person who's meant to be doing skin checks every week and that they're supposed to report um, any um, um, potential um, skin changes to a nurse or a doctor. So that was part of my recommendation. I also uh, talked about um, enforcing um, use of appropriate PPE. So that guy who was wearing the latex gloves, he was the newest recruit. So he'd been there eight months. He found that the PVC gloves were just too uncomfortable for him. And so they said, well, find something that is comfortable for you. So he went out and bought a box of latex gloves. So it obviously had no um, knowledge about the health effects of uh, chromium. Something else I also mentioned was just, um, you know, to do some, to consider um, engaging a hygienist to do some monitoring um, at the workplace, just to, you know, to, I guess, be sure that they're adhering to the recommended exposure standards. You think that would bankrupt the company? Yes, that's, <laughs> which you mean, you mean doing the, all those things I mentioned or any particular one? Yeah, potentially. Spirometry, <laughs> it's um, so you can get asthma, chronic exposure, it can give you asthma. Um, and so the spirometry, so, so what in particular do you want to know about so spirometry? Yes. Um, I guess you'd want to know um, just more about the, how well controlled the asthma is. Um, you'd want to know what particular tasks they were going to be involved in, in the workplace. Um, and then you'd have to just, I guess, monitor it, um, just do some um, regular monitoring and ask them to report any symptoms that they develop. Um, if they're having worsening, worsening of the asthma to report and they have to um, do an assessment at that stage. I guess having asthma per se, you know, you, you may not need to just exclude them just because of that. And there were actually two workers there who, who did have asthma, but it was seasonal asthma, and it wasn't being um, exacerbated by, by working there. Yeah. Yeah.
right, so we've got a nice healthy attendance here. So it's a very dry topic, uh, CPD, so bear with me. Uh, I think everyone knows me from the room, but for those who are logged in via the Zoom teleconference, uh, Dominic Yong, I'm an occupational physician from Melbourne. I've been joined uh, in this talk by Michael Pooley, who's sitting at the front of the room, and Michael works at the uh, College of Physicians in Sydney, and he's from, uh, works as a project officer. He's a uh, works closely with the CPD uh, unit. What we're going to do now is uh, really just go through the whys, the hows, the whats of the CPD changes. Maybe some suggestions or some scenarios. We'll follow up some uh, with some questions and with some answers. So why are we changing? Because this is something which, from my perspective, snuck in at the end of last year with some sort of email. And I thank Nathan who picked it up and, and told me about it. But the CPD is changing because of the Medical Board of Australia. So uh, the Medical Board of Australia was uh, asked to look at the issue of revalidation. So they were asking, uh, as you know, the Medical Board, they're there to protect the community from us who are performing poorly. And they were asked to see whether they should be looking at uh, maybe a board type of exam, like what the Americans do, or a revalidation process where you have to sit an exam on a regular basis to prove your fitness to work. They, they created an uh, expert advisory group and they looked at the evidence and they said that they, we didn't really need in our setting to have revalidation, but we should be strengthening our CPD. So our previous CPD, where we can be quite passive with our learning, turn up, listen to a talk, go to a, a conference, do journal reading, they're trying to bring in some other forms of learning, which is more active, and we'll go through them as well. So how's it going to work? And actually, you can get all these slides. I'll, I'll skim through these slides. I'll send it uh, to the college to send to all of you. But essentially, there's going to be three categories that you're going to get your points. So if we look at what we do currently, you've got to get your 100 points a year. A lot of that you can get from uh, going to a lecture and sitting in a conference and reading your journals. Now what's going to happen is with these three categories, and I'll go through them here, the educational activity component, you can get a maximum of 60 points of your 100. And that's one point per hour. There are two new categories. One's called reviewing performance, which looks at more the process of the work that you're doing. It may involve a bit more peer review and reflection. And the other one's measuring outcomes. So again, looking at maybe your outcomes of your work and do some form of measurement, whether it be your reports or really, really anything. So there is a wide scope when I did a bit more reading. The, the new, two new categories are three credits per hour. So what you, most of them, you maybe like me would be getting your 60 points on educational activities. There's your 60 hours. The other 40 points you'll get from the other two categories, they're three points per hour, so you will need to get uh, 14 hours dedicated to that. So what do we do? Uh, the first thing is the College of Physicians gave me this, uh, gave me a few slides of some examples. The educational activities, I think you're probably all across, so you probably don't need to worry about that. Uh, with reviewing performance, these are some examples. And the, the first thing I'd point out is the, the professional development plan. We'll go that into a little bit more detail as well. There's a lot of activities here which are called a peer review. And I suppose as a consequence of this, um, I know in my work up at Coolaroo and there's another opposition, we have now, as of last week, started the Coolaroo Clinic peer review group. So I probably would encourage you all to start your own peer review group. The other one is the, the measuring outcomes. And again, the College of Physicians gives you, through the CPD department, a few examples. This, uh, these are some of their resources and supports. And again, if you've got any questions, um, you've got a phone number and an email address. One thing I found interesting with the slides they gave, uh, gave me was uh, recording your CPD on the go, so on your phone makes it easier to um, enter all your um, details. So what I would suggest, like for example, you can just take a picture of me on the slide and that proves you were here and that's your sort of, a, you'll upload that. Is that how it would work, Michael? Well, and, and then the record goes to the Sure. So that's another yes. 
but would the photo work? Uh, no. no, okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, don't listen to my advice. <laughs> all right, so I've got to give you some examples. This is what I thought from my own practice. So I've uh, printed out my, my CPD summary for 2019. So I have uh, three points and I've got 97 to go. Um, so one thing which I have just done is creating a personal development plan. So if you haven't done this, uh, get onto this. Uh, it, you just go through the website, log in, do your learning needs analysis, work out what you want to learn and work out your strategies to, to get there. But this is uh, three points per hour for creating your PDP as well as three points per hour for continuing to review it. So, and if you were to spend over the course of the year, I don't know, let's say Michael, five hours or whatever, then that you multiply that by three and that's your 15 points. Is my, are my maths correct? <laughs> Yes. So consider that, have a look, um, and again, I've got the link there. The, the second example is the peer review group. So have a think about whether you do get together with other rock physicians. And, and I suppose if you look at maybe why they're giving you points this way, the, the, the expert advisory group um, in their report, they looked at some of the risk factors for poorly performing doctors. And they do talk about professional isolation as one of the risk factors. And I assume, therefore, by starting interacting with the peers and therefore not being professionally isolated, that sort of gives you some protection against that. Again, I, I suppose everyone who's here is probably therefore not professionally isolated, so we should be getting that message across to those who aren't here. Sure. CBD is always linked uh, at your discretion. And if you feel that the right person to review the work you're doing in a particular area is an expert and not another adjunct physician, then I, I think we would listen to you and listen to the outside of you. Uh, you know, who's the right person to give you advice about the work that you're doing? So, so for example, there'd be some op physicians who may regularly with psychiatrists in a peer re review group talking about mental health issues in the workplace. So that would, yep, yeah. Andrew, Andrea?
sure of the best way to answer that. I guess some aspects of your work in terms of the management of, of the, uh, the work that you're doing We can't hear again on the audio. If it's about your um, medical expertise, then you have to find someone who can give you some peer. Uh, yeah. so, so, for example, there are the 360 degree reviews. Could that be used in that sort of setting where you're working not with other doctors? Could uh, your team be reviewing you and your patients or your, your other? Certainly that's the case, yes. Mm. Um, generally, again, you're advised to get feedback from a number of uh, peers, uh, other physicians, but it wouldn't be if you're seeking feedback from 15 colleagues, they're not all going to be physicians. There might be three or four physicians um, and the rest will be uh, administrative staff. It might be nursing staff that you work with. Um, yes. I nearly finished. Uh, so I gave, found some examples of non-peer activities. So again, some feedback on my list I've written here, but this just came off the, uh, the, the CPD uh, list, the you know audit, auditing of medical legal reports. This is like met, potentially measuring outcomes. You can reflect on your professional outcomes. There are patient satisfaction surveys, clinical audits. I suppose I'll put the question mark for clinical audits. So I, many years ago was a GP and, and as a GP they created some sort of category like this, a particular category point where you had to do clinical audits where you got patients and you collected data and therefore you looked at potentially a cycle of change. Would the College of Physicians have any sort of clinical audits that we could tap into where we could with our patients measure, you know, depression scores or whatever, something along those lines? So uh, the college doesn't have at this point, uh, and because we're um, in the process of, of beginning and to develop resources that will be useful around this. So part of this is uh, input from you around what's needed and what's not. Um, so no, there's not uh, a format that you can use to do a specific clinical audit. There are tools available through the website, general audit tools. They're called clinical audit, but they would apply more broadly than just clinic, clinical audits. Um, you could be auditing a number of different things. You could be auditing, um, you know, how uh, standards are implemented in a particular, uh, you know, situation where you're involved. Um, so there are, uh, there are suggestions for audits that can be done um, that are available through the website, and I can show you where those are shortly. Um, but there's not at this point, um, and whether there will be in future, I don't know whether they'll be useful or not, but there's not uh, currently a place where you can go and join an audit that the college is sponsoring around a particular topic. Okay. And then the last, oh, sorry, Gary. Yep. <laughs> Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Are they looking to for the see quality, for the quality of our reports? Okay. No, that all... it meets their meets the requirements for an independent medical examination because there are set criteria. So, um, uh, I think what you would be looking for there is what's your response to the outcome of the audit. So. If there's an outcome of the audit that says this should change or whatever, there may be some um, uh, uh, activity that you do, some time you spend um, reflecting on making changes as a result of that audit. That's, I think if I understand correctly, um, what you'd be looking at in terms of claims and credits. If you do a review, an audit or a peer review of someone else's work, um, or you do it of your own. If you sit down with the last five reports you've done and assess them against that uh, same work cover set of criteria and look at changes that you might make, that's an audit. 
Yes, I'm Helen My name's Helen Kelsall. I'm a public health physician, but we are just so excuse me for that. <laughs> um, I work with occupational health physicians in the in the university sector, and um, we have formed a peer review group, which also includes clinicians who work in hospital practice. So we've got a mixture of people, but we were looking through these um, examples and really for some of us struggling, you know, a lot of our work involves research and education. So struggling with the clinical examples and um, thinking how do, does a lot of our practice in research and education, what will we do for audit and tangible outcomes? I mean, we. NHMRC encourages you to think of the outcomes of your research, etc. Um, do you have any comments there? Um, this is an area that um, there is some shared um, lack of uh, appreciation of how those things are going to best work. Um, so I think the the medical board has recognised and the feedback that, you know, some of these things don't fit very well for some for the work of some physicians. Um, and uh, hopefully there will be guidance from the medical board over time about how some of these things will be dealt with. Um, certainly uh, the CPD unit is talking to physicians and we're gathering that information to take back to the college's CPD committee. Um, and there may be some outcomes from that process. Um, and anyone is welcome to talk through some of those issues with the, you know, people at the CPD committee, uh, CPD unit at, in the college. Um, but there aren't always easy answers to some of these questions. Could I, could I just give one example of a tangible one that we came up with um, to see if this is sort of acceptable. We, the student evaluations for say units that we might teach in occupational health or in public health, you know, students evaluate those units, give feedback. We should take that feedback on and yes. revise units accordingly to teach them again. Is that the sort of thing that would be um, part of a feedback um, performance feedback, you know, reflection cycle? Um, yeah, it feels like that would certainly be in the, uh, the right space. Mm -hmm. um, again, if you're auditing the feedback that you've received, it might be looking back over time um, at the data that you have available and, you know, to see what changes should be made as a result of, of that feedback. Um, but if, if you're primarily involved in teaching, then um, we have to find ways to help you look at how you, um, I mean, what's important to you is that the energy that goes into um, your CPD is about improving your teaching. Okay. Nathan? Yeah. Nathan? This, is, uh, this is sort of related to yeah. one of the other questions, and I think it's more to do about when you, you're doing things and you're working in teams. So you're, you're sort of meeting the requirements, like you're reviewing medical records, but you may review it as part of a group. And whether that's something that's acceptable or does it all have to be individual activities? Um, um, so... Um, so there are different ways that, that we do practice and it's clearly legitimate for the specialty that we're in to do it in that fashion. Yeah. And whether that's acceptable or not. Um, I'll, I'll clarify this. My understanding is that, and, and one of the examples in the, um, um, you know, in the framework is peer review of cases. That doesn't mean it has to be just two people um, sitting down. So if there is a peer review group that involves a number of people looking at cases, looking at changes that should be made, all of those people uh, can claim the credits for that work. Bruce? Um, no, this is a question to you, Dominic. Sure. Um, what's happening within the faculty then? Obviously, there's a huge amount of information that's come up tonight. Is this now being consolidated at a peak level in the faculty itself, 
so that we present some consolidated, coherent view to the college and hence to the medical board? Or is it going to be bits and pieces all over the place? That's the first question. And then secondly, would there be any chance of extending this conversation at the AGM in Auckland? So that there, again, we get some feedback of where all this is going. So the first point, there has been some discussion at a council level, so, and the council meeting is tomorrow. So, yeah, so for those who don't know, I'm the Victorian councillor. So we'll, we'll be talking about that. That's fine. Um, the second point was, if you wanted to bring it into the program for Auckland, then you would need to talk about it with the program organisers. So. I don't want to, but it just seems to me logical. Yeah, well, I think, you know, what we did as a region is, uh, and you know, Nathan pointed out to, to me, and we talked about it as a committee at our very last committee meeting, and we said we need to be across this, and that's why we devoted the first session of the year to it, so you now will have 10 months to get your affairs in order. Um, but at a broader level, yeah, there will be some discussion. There's really, I'd like to see the consolidation of all this stuff <laughs> as to what the faculty is points are or questions it's raising going forward uh, so we know our various con concerns are in fact on that shopping list mm -hmm. that's being put together within the faculty. Yes, it is. My observation in having a look at all of this, and I spent quite a lot of time trying to understand it, it, there's very little applicability if you're not in a clinical setting. The majority of things apart from auditing medical legal reports and peer review is very much around the grand round um, those sorts of models, well, safety audits in hospitals, that sort of stuff. There's actually not a lot if you're not doing face-to-face -face clinical work, which is quite a lot of us here. Yes, uh, I agree as well. At that point, you'd go back. Yeah. Okay. Can, can I ask a good yeah. question? Yeah, sure. Go oh, ahead. Is that a yeah, really yeah. Right. sorry. Um, just one question. Is it a is it a annual 100 points or is it like the um, RACGP where it's a triennium? And if it is annual, I'm thinking about stage C trainees who may not get their fellowship till, you know, August, September, October this year. Are they expected to get 100 points in three months? Has that been thought about? Okay, the first point, it is annual, 100 points. Uh, the second point, if you come through halfway through, I... Don't know. Do you know, Michael? Uh, I don't know the details of that. I'll find out. I, I know there's not an unrealistic requirement, so um, I'll have to. But I don't know the details of that. That would be the CPD unit who can tell you that, and I can find that out. And that would be pretty tough. I would have thought. Uh, a related question: hmm. Can you give us some insight as to what the audit process is as it relates to our college, rather than the whole? In other words, the audit of performance, which I understood was on a sample or a few five years percent. ago, a sample five of people, percent, yeah. five percent who are subjected to scrutiny by whomever, don't know who that is, but do you know anything about the process? I think you're telling me now. I thank you for letting me know. I've got no idea. So I can find out for you and report back. Well, well um, in, that won't change um, in the sense that uh, if you're chosen for audit, we'll be just asking you to um, ensure that the evidence is there for the things that you've claimed. So that, that won't change. Currently, you know, if you have claimed um, involvement in um, uh, peer review of cases or grand rounds, there needs to be some evidence of that and we'll be looking for the same kind of evidence. Um, so that, that won't really change, uh, you know, and that can range from, um, you know, having the minutes from the grand round meeting, have someone sign off to say that, yes, you intended these meetings, um, that, that's the same. Okay, just my last suggestion, and this is a plug for Bert, is to become a trainee supervisor. So you get to go to the, uh, the Supervisor Professional Development Program. There's a photo of the 2018 program run the day before the Sydney conference. So that was run by June Sim, a WA uh, fellow. And there's very small class numbers. You can see there's three of us in total. So I'd, I'd encourage you to do that. That was three points an hour. You get to re the reflection on professional outcomes. And as a 
supervise when you do your training sessions, these other things, the case-based discussions, the, the mini CXs, the, the DOFs, they are educational activities. But one thing I was trying to discuss with Michael was that if the trainees fed back about how the training session went, does that count as a some form of reviewing performance as a teacher? And um, the answer is uh, no. It, it remains in the educational space unless, uh, and this goes back to the what I responded to before. And if you're sitting down with a group looking at, uh, you know, in a in a unit, if you're doing that training with other people, and you sit down and look at those, the data that you have um, on the responses from the super, super uh, the trainees and make changes or look to are there changes indicated from this feedback, that's a kind of audit. But if you're just getting feedback from a one or two trainees mm -hmm. uh, and reflecting on that and the changes, so you will get uh, an extra reflection credit for that, mm -hmm. but it's not, it doesn't take you into an audit. The reflection on the professional outcomes, can you do that? As, have I given them this, uh, this thickened bullet point? Yes, if they do that, the supervisors, do they get the three points per hour? Um, I'm not, no, I'm not quite with you there, sorry. So when you do the reflection on professional yes, outcomes, that's an activity. Yes, it is. They can do that as a in their training sorry. sessions. Can they collect their three points an hour from that? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm missing. How, how is this? So, um, Reflection on professional outcomes is a new one. If this was one suggested by the medical board. Um, we haven't had direction about what that is about. Um, if you're reflecting on, I, I think in, in your role as a supervisor, there would be a couple of ways to go and there are some resources available to you to get either peer feedback um, or to uh, go through the, the standards that, that are set for uh, supervisors and reflect on um, those. So if it's a structured activity like that, yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, we have time for a few more questions. Roy? Um, you said uh, the end, I think the first category, you said 60 hours, 60 points. Yeah, it's actually 30 hours and 30 points reflection. That's it doesn't true. have to be 60 hours at a that's, conference. That's true. If you um, do a reflection for each educational activity, that will provide you with two credits for that activity. And just just a couple of general things. Um, that it's, um, this was, sorry, this is the College of Physicians slide. They did say 50 hours of CPD a year. Yes. So you still need to qualify for that? So, um, uh, so just to clarify uh, how this will work, um, what the MBA has said is eventually uh, all doctors will do 50 hours of CPD. Now that doesn't start, they were originally flagging next year and it's likely to be after that. The college decided that it would be useful to move CPD into the same um, framework as the medical board is suggesting. But at the moment, as a transition, it's staying with 100 credits. So, um, and, and it's encouraging everybody to do some CPD in those categories two, which is reviewing performance, or category three, which is measuring outcomes. But it, it, you can get 100 credits for less than 50 hours in this interim period. So at the moment, um, there's not uh, the focus is not so much on 50 hours of CPD. That's what the medical board has flagged for the future. And many people will do more than 50 hours because they will get a majority of their their hours from um, education, which is the one credit. The subscribing to a journal because I read at least an hour a week. That's 50 hours. So having the evidence that you subscribe to the journal, your Medline searches, when you've yes. gone up to check something. Yes. So that's sufficient detail. I'm just wondering how much data we're going to have to put together here. Um, I, I, it's not going to be much more than what you already do. 
Um, so, uh, you know, uh, there's currently a revision of the CPD evidence log that um, you can indicate the number of hours you've spent on a range of activities that you get your colleague to sign off on, and that will be sufficient evidence. Any colleagues to sign off that you're reading? <laughs> no, sorry, I thought you were talking about some of those other things. No, oh, no, I, mean, I was talking about I was talking about things like journals, which no, is well, automatically an hour a week that you'd be doing. And uh, it's <laughs> the same level of uh, evidence that's required now. It's not more evidence, and one of the things, um, just to uh, pick up, I know that the medical board did uh, is interested in identifying and supporting underperforming physicians or doctors, but. The main thrust of this was not about that. It was um, uh, what they uh, indicated was there's evidence that that more interactive, engaging CPD has more of an impact than um, some of the more traditional didactic educative uh, um, activities, and they wanted to, to move people towards that. So that's what sort of fundamentally you know, underneath it. So another question would be like peer review. What would be considered a maximum number in a room before it's in a lecture rather than <laughs> peer review? So, so let me ask, um, the, the two presentations today that you've all participated in, and presume, I don't know whether that happens at every meeting, but, but if it does, then over the course of a year, you're attending, I don't know, maybe two hours of, of those, is that an educational activity or is it a peer review of cases? Um, you know that better than I do. Um, does it line up more with the kind of grand round that happens in a hospital, which was my hunch, or is it actually a peer review of cases? I think it should be a peer review of cases now, of three points per hour. And <laughs> 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 what is it? It's a peer review of cases. <laughs> so you've presented a case, we've provided the feedback, we've picked it apart. I think it should be a peer review of cases. That hour should be a peer review, and then you might have an hour of education. I think we should restructure the. <laughs> I'd be interested in other opinions about that. Uh, to me, it, it seems like, and I, I don't know, I'm not, uh, but it seems to me more like what would happen at a grand round where somebody presents a case to a big group of people and there's a little bit of questions, which is a one credit activity. I mean, you need to make the call in, in relation to that, but uh, that would seem more like what, what happened. Right, and just before we finish, just want to give an opportunity to those who are logged in by the Zoom teleconference if they've got any questions. No? Okay. Well, I think Michael's agreed to hang around for a bit yes. longer, so we might finish the public talk and people have specific question. Before we go, James is going to if I can just say one thing. What I might do, I was going to show you some of the resources that you may find useful. They won't, they are, the resources we have now currently are more directed towards, I guess, the bulk of the profession and so it's, you'll need to adjust them and whatever, but um, I will send some links. Um, I'll get the the list of people who are here and, and on uh, via the link, but to, um, uh, and I would be happy to get feedback about whether or not they're helpful in any way. I'm not saying they're going to answer all your questions, but there may be some things in there that will provide some usefulness. James? Sorry, just some housekeeping. Um, Two things. One, I've been approached uh, to find any fellows or trainees who are interested in doing um, fitness examinations for hyper hyperbaric chamber workers. So if you're interested, please email me back and I'll forward your details on to the relevant person. Second aspect is that uh, just a bit of a heads up for the next couple of meetings. The next meeting in April will be a respiratory theme. One in June will be environmental and one in August will be mental health. Um, so, oh yes, and the one in August is the Memorial Lecture for Kevin, uh, which uh, will have quite a few sort of extra whiz things associated with it at that time. 
Um, that's it. Thank you.